And our next speaker is Simon Carley. Simon is a consultant in emergency medicine, working in adult and paediatric emergency and trauma centres at one of the busiest hospitals in the UK. Please welcome Simon. Thank you so much. And thanks for giving me the opportunity to be here and to share the stage with these wonderful people. I've heard a lot about Don't Forget the Bubbles over the years, and this is the first time I've made it to the conference, so I'm delighted to be here. I've been asked to do a little thing over the next 20 minutes around this concept of how it feels, because that's the sort of theme for this session, isn't it? And in order to do that, we're going to use our ideas, our feelings, and our thoughts about how we do practical procedures in the emergency department and the paediatric emergency department in particular. And I think it is relevant that my practice is in paediatrics and, and adult emergency medicine because it means that I see a whole variety of different things. Some, di some things are done quite differently in adult practice as compared to paediatric practice. And having that breadth of experience just gives me little different perspectives and, and ideas about how we look at the world. But during this talk, I am going to hopefully challenge you in the way that Damien suggested that this conference is all about this morning. And I want you to listen to what I'm saying, but perhaps not necessarily agree with me at times. You can have your own view of this, because I want you to think about the issues through the lens of your own practice. Because some of you will have practices which are very different to me, and that's OK. But I just want you to see how your perspectives are slightly different from mine. So let's start with a case. It's the emergency department. And I'm mostly going to talk about work in the emergency department and the standby phone rings. Now, at that moment, a little lift in excitement in the room, maybe, in the department. You sort of move slightly towards the standby phone as the senior nurse picks it up, and you listen in to what's going to go on. And it's a good one. 14-year-old, <laughs> fall from height, GCS 14, 13, they're quite worried about this kid. They're a little bit on the hypertensive side. They're tachycardic. There's no IV access. They've tried. They can't get it. There's a possible pneumothorax and a possible abdominal injury. Good stuff? Yeah? Cool. OK, so you go into analytical mode. This is an unemotional, absolutely straight down the line. We're going to develop exactly what we need to do. We're going to share our mental model, and we're going to brief the team unemotionally, safely and with purpose. Do you all agree? Or we're going to go, awesome! Right, this is amazing. I mean, there's a case coming in. It's paediatrics. Don't see a huge amount of paediatrics. It's trauma. We all love a bit of trauma. And it's got no IV access. That's even better, because I might be able to get the IO gun out and actually drill into a child and get our IO because it's really good fun. And there's a possibility of a pneumothorax, so a chest strain. Haven't seen one of them done in ages. And actually, that major hemorrhage plan that we talked about in PEM Adventures at DFTB, I think we're going to activate it. This sounds like the case, and I'm going to get a load of assessments signed off on this, and it's going to be awesome. <laughs> you sick, weird, horrible, <laughs> crazy people. Because just stop for a moment. This perspective, and I saw this in the PEM Adventures. If you're in the PEM Adventures session, when the guys were talking about doing stuff, you could hear it rise in the room. And yet, that's weird. This child is probably going to have a life-changing event. That family is going to have a life-changing event. It's probably going to be the most significant day of that family's experience, perhaps ever. It could even be the last day of that child's life. And yet, you bunch of weirdos are excited. And that's a bit odd. And I just want you to hold that thought, because we'll come back to it later. Because actually in paediatrics, and as I say, I do adults in paediatrics, but and in paediatrics we spend quite a lot of our time, and I suppose we do in adults as well, doing procedures which are actually unpleasant, painful, and distressing to children. And I'm sure everybody in this room here has held a child down in some way, shape, or form and inserted needles into them. That's not normal, folks. I mean, I know you've been sort of been doing it for quite a bit of time now, but you can't do that on the Clapham omnibus. You get arrested. It's a bit odd. Now, I'm not going to get into the ethics and the consent thing. Clearly, it is ethical, and it is appropriate, and it is legal for you to do this. But stop and think. Is it always the right thing to do? Do we spend as much time as we could 
both trying to get children to understand what's going on and making sure that the procedures are as undistressing as possible. So when your medical student comes up and tells you, I want to do paediatric emergency medicine, I want to be like you, because I love children, I love speaking to families, do we have to have an interesting conversation with them that the experience on day-to-day -day might be quite difficult? Hmm. So let's have a think about some of the things we do. These are some of the things which I do in the emergency department, and this is how I feel about them. And again, if you're in the PEM Adventure session, you will know that this is true, because you all agreed with the last one. <laughs> it's just a fact. Not a bad person. Not a bad person. But the perspective of children is really very different. And you will have experienced this. And you will know this. And then there's families. And the other group, which is not on the slide, are us, actually. And when I started putting this talk together, I had this arrogant assumption that this was a new thought that I'd had. It wasn't quite that bad. But I hadn't seen a huge amount in the literature about these issues around how we feel about um, events in the emergency department, how families feel. And in fact, there is a lot of literature out there. But it's in the nursing literature, and it's mostly qualitative. And as a doctor, I will admit, and I think it's the same for many of us, we don't read that part of the literature enough. But there's a lot of work out there that suggests that these things are significantly distressing for families, and actually also for nurses and for doctors who are coming into the profession. Once you've been in for a period of time, you can become a little bit desensitized to these issues. But at the beginning, take yourself back. Speak to your medical students when they've been through even something like a, a distressing cannulation in the emergency department. So it's tricky, and our perspectives are different, and we need to remember that. And that takes me to this. It's the two reasons, the two universal reasons for every procedure. Any procedure in any specialty at any time has two indications. I want you to remember this. Number one, the patient needs it. Now, you think that's obvious, but is it always? Do we always do painful and difficult procedures in children because they absolutely need it, or are we doing them sometimes because we want to do them, or because we're blindly following a protocol or a rationale that somebody else has decided and hasn't modified for that individual patient? And the second one, it sounds a little bit iffy that we would perhaps do a procedure because we just want to do it, but again, if you're in the PEM adventures, when I can't remember which one of the, the characters they had in there, that Brad really wanted to do the chest drain. We've all been there. So I put it to you to think about how we do this, particularly with children, because they are not consenting for themselves. Their parents are consenting to it. And actually, we are, to some extent, removing the rights of the child. And that takes me to um, John Hines, who is a, a friend and an emergency anaesthetist and pre-hospitalist from Northern Ireland, when he talked about doing thoracotomies, again discussed earlier today, is that part, one of your decision-making processes for that, because you'll always be criticised if you do a thoracotomy, you'll also, also be criticised if you don't do a thoracotomy in a patient with a penetrating chest injury. So you're going to get criticised either way. But the decision is, are your intentions honourable when you make the decision? Are yours? Are your colleagues? And are the people you train? Hopefully they are, and that's great. So anyway, we've been through this a little bit, and I just want you to keep those thoughts in your head as we move through. And we make a plan for our procedure. We're going to assemble the people, the kits, the equipment. We're going to have a checklist. We're going to do all of those things together, and we're going to get a plan together. It might be cannulation. It might be doing an LP. It might be organizing something like a chest drain and stuff like that. And you've got a great plan. And if that works, awesome. But the second thing the conference organizers wanted me to talk about are those times when plan A doesn't work. So let me tell you a story. And it's based on a true story, but I've changed a lot of the facts um, to protect anonymity, but don't tweet it out. So we're in the emergency department, and a young uh, woman comes into the department, and she's seen presenting with a severe headache and altered level of consciousness, maybe some weakness on the left-hand side. And it's a difficult, difficult diagnosis, because there's not a lot of history coming out of the patient, but clearly this person needs a CT scan. And one of the concerns here is that they've had a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So we're getting ready to go to CT, and at that point, she becomes quite unwell. Drops the GCS, BP goes up, and we think, right, great, she's not safe enough to take her out to CT now. She's going to need an RSI. 
And so that's what we do. I've got an assembled team there. I've got another consultant colleague with me who's very experienced. And we give this lady a neuroprotective anesthetic, and it's fine. Tube goes in, grade one view, we're all nice and stable, and now we're packaging up, ready to go to CT. And just changing the monitors over, and you know, the, the plethysmography, the, the trace on the um, SATs, just disappears. So obviously you reposition it, and then you reposition it again, and then you check for a pulse, let's be honest. And there is no pulse. And you think, shit, I've just done something. something and it's starting to go wrong, and my emotions are now starting to get worried. A, because things are going wrong, but B, because I think I'm actually potentially part of the issue. But it's okay. It's not the first person who's arrested on me post-intubation. Don't judge me. It's the emergency department. Stuff happens. And I think I can get out of this. So the CPR is starting, and we think, oh, it's probably, is the tube in the wrong place? No, it's okay. And tidal CO2 is great. Is it the blood pressure? Um, well, the blood pressure is gone, because no thing. Do I need um, a vasoconstrictor? So I'm going to give some fluids, and then get the adrenaline out, and I'm going to give some adrenaline, and it's still not working. And now... I'm in a really bad place. I'm completely focused. I've handed over some of the control to my colleague. I'm sweating. I'm tachycardic. I'm hypertensive. I can't really think. And then someone says, get the ultrasound on. So we put the ultrasound on. And there's a massive cardiac tamponade, completely unexpected. And then I'm back up because, A, I've made an awesome diagnosis. And, B, I kind of know what to do about it. So I've now got an ultrasound machine and a, a needle and a syringe going through the skin and the ultrasound machine fails. So you mess with the ultrasound machine, and again, you're back in tachycardia. It's unpleasant. You completely zoned out. Fortunately, my colleague is running the arrest, and you can't get it to work. But you say, it's OK, I'm old, so I trained before ultrasound. So I'm going to go sub -ziphoid and blind, and I go in, and there's nothing. And I go in again, and there's nothing. And then the cardiology reg comes in, and manages to get it. I, by this time, am a complete and utter mess. We get ROSC, and I'd like to tell you that the story ends well, but sadly it doesn't. It was a, a very severe um, aortic dissection, uh, which was the cause of the headache and the lateralizing signs at the beginning, and unfortunately, the patient died. I don't think it would have made any difference, but me, my colleagues, and everyone in the room were kind of in bits. And you look back and you think, maybe that didn't go as well as it could have done. So as Mike Tyson said, everybody's got a plan until you get punched in the face. And sometimes procedures, when they go wrong, feel like that. It's emotive. So let's have a just stop and think and think, could I have done any better or do I do better now? And how do we get ourselves out when we get that moment when things are starting to go wrong? People are starting to question what you're doing. People are asking, are you sure you want to do that? Would you like me to go and get somebody else? How about using this? And you think, just get out of my headspace. I'm in the wrong place. And the way that we've come to organize this, and it's based on Cliff Reed's work from Sydney Hems, is to think about three things that you need to get control of. And this is the same before a patient arrives. It's the same when things start going wrong with homeofactors in the department. And it's the same when you start to lose the plot in a procedure. And it's to gain control of these three things. Number one is yourself. There's virtually no there's virtually nothing in medicine that I can think of, even in a really traumatic recess when you can't take 10 seconds to reboot yourself. During a presentation, if the slides fail now, I will take 10 seconds. I will just say, give me a moment, and I'll reset myself. Now, how you do that, I don't know. But many people have different things. The one I would suggest, because it's easy and it's quick, is to breathe. This is something that comes from yoga. It's described in many things. It's used by the military to refocus and people like fighter pilots and the special services, uh, special forces when they're in difficult situations. And it's simply this, and we're going to do it together. Breathe in. And hold. Breathe out. And hold. Close your eyes. Breathe in. And hold. Breathe out and hold. OK, relax. Are you in a different place in two breaths? Now, I'm not saying it's magic. You will find your own way. If you have nothing, use this. But find a way to reset yourself. Because if you cannot do that, you cannot move on to the next stage, which is to think about your team and how they can help you in these situations. Now, many things we could talk about. We haven't got a huge amount of time. So I'm going to focus on a few that I think are really important, the big wins. And again, you've probably heard a lot of these in simulation teaching, and that's okay. 
The case I described, one of the things I mentioned when I was talking about that is the fact that I had another senior colleague in the room who I could just offload virtually everything apart from the procedure to them. Now, this becomes increasingly important as you become more senior as a clinician because you're expected to do everything. And actually, you might be the only person in the room who can do that procedure, or somebody else has already failed, and now you're sucked into it. And there's a very great tendency among seniors to think that they can still manage the fact that the parents are getting distressed about why this isn't working, the fact that the nurses are asking you about other things, the fact that somebody's put an ECG under your nose to say, is this a myocardial infarction, or long QT syndrome, or whatever. But offloading as much as you can, because you have to accept that you will become very task-focused. Now, there's two ways out of that. You can pretend that you're not, or you can say, I am task-focused. The other tasks need to go to someone else. As a senior clinician, that means I will get somebody else to do it. That may well be for an arrest, and we commonly what we do is I'll get the senior nurse in the emergency department to take over the running of the arrest cycles because they're better at it than I am, whilst I can concentrate on other things. So cognitive offload as much as you can. And then get your team to set yourself some rules. So pediatric cannulation is one of the things which I think probably all of us share as, as an issue which can go fantastically well and sometimes not. Um, and there are that group of patients in whom they are clearly going to require intraosseous access or intravascular access now. So your cardiac arrest patients, they're just going to get an intraosseous straight off. There's a group of patients who are quite sick who you need to get access on but it doesn't feel quite as urgent as I'm just going to go and, and do the I.O. So, for example, we have rules in our department that you have anybody in the department only has two goes at doing a cannulation in a child, and then somebody else does it. The I.O. gun's there because, uh, from Natalie May, who um, originally coined this idea, is that what you do in that kind of situation where it's urgent, um, but you, know, you need to get on with it, is say, senior nurse or colleague, um, I'm going to have two attempts. If we don't manage it after two, we're going to put an I.O. in. If I suggest or attempt a third attempt, you're very welcome to put the intraosseous into me. The sternal route is fine, and that tends to focus the mind and acts as a decision point. But again, it's about cognitively offloading, cognitively offloading those key decision points. And then lastly, the environment, which is probably the most easy to understand, but it's about making sure that your environment is going to improve or change as you go on. One of the things I see with procedures, take intubation as an example, it's probably the best, is that people will fail with their first attempt. Their second attempt will be to do exactly the same, harder or faster. <laughs> and you ask yourself, well, it didn't work the first time. Just putting more force and doing that ain't going to work. You know, the question is in your environment, how is it going to change for your next attempt? Do I have the right equipment? Do I have the space? Do I have the access? Do I have the height? Do I have all the things optimized? to make this work. Now, you should have done all of that before you started. We live in the real world. So self, team, environment. Three ways for you to control what's going on. But let's go back to the procedural paradox. This idea that you're all weird and looking forward to the life-changing event of the 14-year-old who's going to come in. I struggled with this for quite a long period of time. I've got to say, I started writing a blog post in 2013 about it, and I've still not finished it. It will go out after this talk today, if you want to see the science and the, and the, the papers and the, and the stuff behind this. Because I've been thinking about it for a long period of time. Is it really a paradox? Well, I ended up in a conversation with a psychologist. Not for my benefit, it was just a social chat. Um, I am very concerned about being in the presence of psychologists. You make me nervous. And I, I was wondering whether we had some sort of joint personality disorder that we'd either developed or that's why we ended up in the jobs that we are. And, you know, also group psychosis that we developed. And she said no. Her, her example and her, her answer was, was a bit surprising in a way, and, but so obvious. She said, look, if I'm knocked over by a bus tomorrow, or my family is, I want them treated by somebody who's enthusiastic, keen, wants to learn about stuff, wants to be the best that they can, and who isn't at that moment when it really matters, distracted. And so I don't think there is a paradox here. I think you are a bit weird, and that's fine. And maybe actually it's better than fine. Maybe the fact that we are where we are is a great thing. You carry on with your procedures, you do the best you can. If it starts to go wrong, get control of yourself, your team and environment, but just be awesome. Thanks for your time.
Thank you, Simon. Becky, do we have any comments or questions coming from Twitter? We have quite a few comments about people's feelings about doing procedures and how we, and sent, agreeing with that sentiment that we need to think about it from other perspectives. Um, we've got a question from Claire Salter, who is an acute peds reg. Do you have a phrase that always works to hold people adding new, what? adding new tasks when overloaded with jobs that are all urgent? That question doesn't make sense. What was that? Can, let's try reading just it again. i to read it again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, 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 that yeah. might work, you know. Where's Claire? So that's a question about distractions in the in an emergency setting, which is something which is now well researched, and the, the rate of distractions that we have in all of our jobs, in anybody in acute care, paediatrics, adults, or whatever, is absolutely enormous. I think first thing is recognise that you are being distracted, and then thank them for bringing something to you, and then say I will be with you and give a time frame. So the common one for us, there's two. two. One is ECG is coming in. You say thanks, that's really important. Just hold on for 30 seconds. I will be with you in a minute, so that you then genuinely look at it properly and then thank them for bringing it to you, because, let's face it, you told them to bring it to you, so we shouldn't be nasty to these people. And the other one is a classic, is when you're doing something like an RSI, the time between deciding to proceed with the drugs going in and you actually getting control is often when the team goes quiet, which everybody else on the periphery of the team thinks now is a great time to ask a load of questions because you've stopped talking. And that is about having somebody stood back who's controlling the entire environment who isn't the person necessarily doing the procedure, or usually isn't doing the procedure, and actually crowd controls that. It's, in aviation, it's the no chat below 10,000 rule, as you may hear it described. So when serious procedures are happening, somebody crowd controls so you don't get interruptions during that time. I could talk about that one for hours. Do we have any other questions? If you have a question, just raise your hand. I think Henry's got the mic. Always come and chat to me later. I'm here all week. No? I'm sure they have lots of questions and they will want to chat to you later. Do we have any other comments that we wanted to cover up? Um, I think there was, I think this is a question about how do we stop ourselves becoming desensitized and forgetting how the others are feeling, including our patients? Okay, so I don't think there's actually anything especially wrong on being able to be desensitized in the moment actually, and I'm sure that will be controversial, I don't think it's wrong. I do think it's right that we check ourselves every so often, and I think it's really important that we check our colleagues, particularly as people come through. One of the things we've started being much better at now, and Alan Grayson, who's at the conference, will tell you the same, is doing debriefings after significant events, and events which are significant for other people, not just for us, because over time, the proportion which feel really significant gets smaller and smaller. So actually debriefing and having a chat with people, ideally in a non... So taking them to a, another place, going for a coffee, going for a chat, having a discussion at a different time, and asking them how they feel, not would you like to talk through how we manage VF, but actually asking questions such as, how do you feel? Was that what you expected? Do you feel differently than you expected to do after this? Those kind of exploratory questions. And, I mean, I've got to admit... I've not done that throughout my career. I've probably only started doing it in the last four or five years. And I've been amazed and really interested in some of the reactions and some of the conversations that those sort of opening phrases have led to, particularly with people new into the specialty and medical students. Because classic is, what do you want to do in this placement? I want to do CPR. Yeah, I want to do CPR. Do CPR for the first time. It's not as much fun as you thought it was. And we need to talk and explore that. Thank you, Simon.